morning. Good morning. As a representative of Communities of Shalom, I have the pleasure of introducing our fourth and final prophetic leader in residence. Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder received her Certificate of Ministry Studies and Master of Arts degree from Pacific School of Religion and her Doctor of Ministry degree from San Francisco Theological Seminary. She currently serves as presiding bishop of the Fellowship and senior pastor, City of Refugee, United Church of Christ in San Francisco, a thriving inner city congregation that celebrates the radically inclusive love of Jesus Christ for all, especially homeless, LGBTQQI youth, women and men living with HIV AIDS, and other disenfranchised people of faith, hope, and courage. Bishop Flunder was ordained by Bishop Walter Hawkins of Love Center Ministries in Oakland, California, where she served as associate pastor for several years. She is also an ordained minister of the United Church of Christ. She is author of Where the Edge Gathers, Building a Prophetic Community of Radical Inclusion. Please join me now in welcoming Bishop Yvette Flunder to our chapel. Good morning. Good morning. First let me say, I am so grateful to God to be here. My grandmother would say, angel protection and traveling mercy. You brought us from California. Thank you for the kind invitation and for the welcome and for the weather. God bless you. I'm just really happy. I know that uh, California brings warmth. And since we are here, uh, I've been asked by some to cool it down. So I've been working on that. So tomorrow it should be a little less hot. <laughs> Call me, write me if we need to do anything else to change it. Um, it's good to be here. Shirley is with me. And so that you will know, this is my partner of this month, of, not quite this month, next month, May 25 years we've been together. And I'm so glad to be here. She doesn't mind me telling you she's a cancer survivor, a breast cancer survivor. And I'm always giving that testimony for her because I'm so grateful that God delivered her to us well and healthy and cancer-free. What a great blessing. Let me share. Pentecost. Sometimes when I look at this passage of scripture, I realize that this passage in the book of Mark is a forecast of Pentecost. Let me tell you why. Pentecost has historically been about mysticism and tongues. You see, I was raised in Pentecost. I know Pentecost. About receiving the Holy Ghost. In fact, in Pentecostal circles now, folks get real offended when you say Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, and power. You will receive power. Power to do what? Well, we've come to understand it to make the message of Jesus Christ accessible to everyone. Power to venture out geographically, culturally, and theologically. We begin to understand that the real essence of Pentecost has been, in some ways, held in what I've come to call a cultural and denominational girdle. Now, let me talk to you for a minute about a girdle. <laughs> Not all of you have had the girdle experience in your life. But if you have ever had the experience, you understand it as something that was created by the hands of Satan in heaven. <laughs> to in so many ways control a part of us as women that we really, really would rather not have controlled. And so, some of us have surrendered them, but I have to be honest with you. When I was a girl coming along, I believe there were people that fell out under the charisma of what they believed to be Pentecostal power. But in reality, <laughs> their oxygen was cut off from their brain <laughs> by this girl. In our text today, Jesus is in a place of transition. And his culture was at war with his purpose. It's hard for us to think of Jesus in transition. It's hard for us to think of Jesus in a cultural war, an internal war with purpose. But it's easier for us to see it 
when we can remember being in that place ourselves. All of you who are on the journey from where you were to where you are and to where you're going. You understand the context here that Pentecost was in a girdle because Jesus was in a cultural war, a war with his purpose. Listen, a struggle between his ethnicity, nationality, and worldview, and his call. Anybody know about that? A struggle with his religious background and the teachings of his youth and his call. And here he was in the region of Tyre and Sidon, Phoenician cities, present-day Syria, on foreign soil. And if you read the verses just before the telling of the story that we read today, he was there on purpose. He had just come from a long, long conversation with religious people, Sadducees and Pharisees and such the like. And he was taking some time out, some R&R. &R. Essentially, he went to Vegas. <laughs> he went among people who weren't going to church. This is true. People who had other gods, they had their own kings, they had their own coin, their own systems, their own government, traveling incognito. According to the text, he didn't want people to know where he was. It gets like that sometimes. You need to go somewhere where folk don't have expectations of you. You understand? Amen. So you can breathe in and out without somebody saying, ain't you supposed to be a preacher? <laughs> <laughs> he had just finished a big debate with the religious institutions back home, and he had debunked the idea that there was a distinction between clean and unclean meat. And that was a big, big task. And along came this woman, while he was on his sabbatical, who heard of his reputation as a healer. And I'm sure he thought the way Shirley says about me sometimes, I can't take you anywhere. <laughs> but the deal was her baby was sick, and she meant to get some help for her child. We live in Marin County, just north of San Francisco, and there's a lot of wooded area like this green area around our house, and we have a lot of deer. In fact, we just have a lot of livestock, period. Just, we have deer and jackrabbits and turkeys now. Wild turkeys that come to visit. Huge wild turkeys that come to visit. And the deer kind of has that Bambi kind of look. You know, we have spotted. They're just beautiful. They're just incredibly beautiful. They're very gentle to watch going and coming. And, so one day Shirley was out walking our dog, and she met a deer, a doe, and a fawn. And so my dog greeted them the way my dog greets other four-legged citizens of the planet, with much barking. And we found out something about Bambi that day. If you come for Bambi's baby, Bambi transforms <laughs> right before your eyes. Gets back on her back hoofs. She can raise her front hoofs. She makes a noise. And she turns into something. Well, that's what happened that day. You see, I know something about how folks are about their children. And the calmest, kindest, gentlest people can come for you with fangs and claws about their children. And this woman, was here to see Jesus about her baby, about her child. But Jesus was about to be challenged with destroying not the idea of clean and unclean meat, but destroying the idea of clean and unclean people. That's so why I said, well, didn't Jesus come here knowing that? I want to cut Jesus some slack. I want to believe in this moment that the man from Nazareth had human experiences in the truest sense of the word. And that would include an inability to see as broadly as he came to see, as he continued to evolve theologically. Is that all right? Can we give Jesus some room and space to evolve theologically? If you had to do it, 